So now with some background to sensation and perception and just why we study it and um, that perceptual process, we're going to start talking about measuring perception. We begin with these different approaches to measuring perception. So the first approach is the psychophysical approach, which is the physics, okay, is the physical piece. And the psycho is what are we experiencing, right? The psychology behind um, what's happening with the, with the physics, or how we're experiencing those physics. Um, much of this uh, research was really started by and is due to uh, Gustav Fechner, who I'll try not to gush about for too long uh, so that I don't make this, this video too long. But he wrote The Elements of Psychophysics back in 1860. Uh, which was republished in 1966, as this is really a seminal work. And if you notice the date on this work in 1860, if you know your psychology history, the first psychology lab is said to have been in 1879, started by Wilhelm Bundt. And so this is 19 years. This publication was 19 years before any psychology labs existed. And so um, this was brave research to do because at that time people thought we should not be looking at the mind at something so subjective with something as our our own minds and so they assumed that this would have to be a subjective kind of examination more like philosophy than a science and so Gustav Fechner um, originally used quantitative methods only to measure the relationships between the stimuli, so the physics out in the world, he systematically uh, manipulated those stimuli. So how bright is this light? Is it twice as light? Is, it, is there twice as much light? And he would systematically um, change the amount of light and then ask people about their perception. And it was basic, do you see it? Can you tell a difference? Those kinds of really basic questions about, again, something that can be quantitatively measured, and do you see it or hear it, yes or no? Looking at these three approaches, we're going to start with this psychophysical approach, or what he now calls, or they call, relationship A, where we're looking at the relationship between the stimulus, so the physics out in the world, and the perception. In this case, we're going to ask a person to tell us the orientation of the lines in a grading pattern. And so we're going to come back to these grading patterns this is a measurement of what's called grading acuity. Uh, and as you can tell from those um, patterns over to the right, they can differ in contrast. So if we're going from black to white, there's a great deal of contrast. But you can see that some of those have slightly different shades of gray. And so the question is, how much can we lower that contrast? Well, you can still say, yes, I can see this, right? I can still see that this are, these are vertical lines or these are oblique 45 degree lines. Um, and then we can also make them wider or more narrow or narrower. So as we get more and more narrow, as you can see the one from the bottom right, the second one off to the right there, um, we get narrower. How narrow can we get those lines before you can't, can no longer see them? And so it turns out in this psychophysical measure, we have asked people to do this, tell us the orientation of the lines and the grading patterns. And people can see for longer with at lower contrasts and at narrower lines, um, vertical and horizontal lines. This is what's called the oblique effect, that we lose those oblique lines. Um, earlier, we have a higher threshold, so a lower sensitivity for those oblique lines. Approach is a physiological approach, which they call relationship B which is now between the stimulus and some physiological process. And so a lot of this research in sensation and perception historically has come from utilizing animals. And so in this case, they were looking at a ferret, which is why I put that cute picture of a ferret up there. And now we can, we can do the same thing where we are measure or we are manipulating that stimulus, lowering and raising the threshold of the contrast uh, making them more and less narrow, right? And to see uh, what's happening now, they're measuring at the level of the visual cortex. And it turns out when we're measuring in a ferret at the visual cortex, there are more neurons, there's more activity in the visual cortex 
um, to vertical and horizontal lines. So we see that same oblique effect uh, played out in the physiology and how much of the visual cortex is responding. We now have what you might think of, or I call the trifecta, right, where we really we, um, get all of those measurements together because now we have these more sophisticated ways of looking at um, brain activities, brain activity in humans. And so now we can put somebody in an fMRI, we can ask them, we can manipulate those lines, whether they're vertical, horizontal, the contrast, the narrow or width of the line. And then we can also ask them, do you see the line? And what we see in this relationship C, uh, we're, we're measuring um, the perception and then the physiological response as well and looking at that relationship. The stimulus is necessarily still out there, which is why I call this the trifecta. We, have, we get it all in one, of these relation, in one of these studies where we have the stimulus out there asking you about your perception, but I'm also getting the physiological measure. In this case, they're show, I'm showing an fMRI. So they did this. They, put people in the um, fMRI, and so they were getting a measurement of brain activity. Uh, people could see the vertical and horizontal lines, um, again, as they got lower and lower contrast, and as they got narrower and narrower, and there was more of a human's visual cortex um, responding in response to those vertical and horizontal lines than in um, response to oblique lines. So we see this same oblique effect and it looks like this is a relationship that we're going to say is true, right? So we can actually see here's the stimulus, this is the perception and the physiology, and it's all um, related to each other. We're seeing these really um, um, converging measures all in one study. The goals of all of these approaches are to explain the physiology behind how we perceive, to explain how brains and neuronal processing really create our perceptions. And as I said earlier in the, in the first bunch of slides, to explore the cognitive influences on perception. So we, we do a lot of really basic perception, but um, a lot of that research has been done. And so what we're interested in oftentimes is that top-down processing or how, how do, how do background experiences and cognition influence our perception. We're going to be looking at um, some of these psychophysical measures. So we're going to back up a minute here and go to the stimulus to perception relationship, and we're going to stay there for a little while. For the physiological measures, we are going to wait and I'm going to be explaining those as we need them, um, as we move forward through the material. I'm going to give you some fun facts that I think he's taken out of the textbook, but I'm not completely sure. Um, but they are fun facts not to memorize or know a bunch of stuff, but just to think about and reflect upon and say, hey, is this how I feel too? So we're going to first look at the absolute threshold. The absolute threshold is we're basically measuring the limits of the sensory systems. Can you see it? Can you hear this? Can you hear this tone? Can you taste something? How much? How much light before you can see it? How high? How What's the amplitude of that sound before you can hear it? Like that. So what's the smallest amount of stimulus energy for you to be able to experience something from the world. This is our measure of absolute threshold. And here are some fun, fun ones to know. So vision, well, we can st see stars at night, which is pretty incredible. Apparently, I don't know how this was measured way back when, but we can see a candle flame 30 miles away on a dark, clear night. Most people think that's hard to imagine. I don't know if you've been in any caves in your life, but when it's truly, truly dark, um, it's amazing. Um, how far away we can see light, I and mean, 30 miles seems like a very long way to me. Again, not sure how they measured this, but um, he did live out where there are some really uh, wide spaces. Hearing, we can hear a ticking watch 20 feet away, and again, you can just reflect, do I think, do I feel like I can hear that? And if you don't know and you have somebody has a watch, you can uh, put it 20 feet away from yourself, we have a lot of noise in our society today, but um, 
you can find a quiet place. For taste, we can taste a teaspoon of sugar in two gallons of water. Again, this is our lowest amount of sugar that we need to taste it. Um, and this one you can go do, right? You can go buy a gallon of water, put a half teaspoon of sugar in it and say, do I taste it? And these are averages. These are averages across lots and lots of humans. And so we should be able to say, yeah, that seems right. But for some of them, they seem, they do seem very small to me. Um, we can smell a drop of perfume in three rooms. I know this is not a very, um, definitive measure. I'm not really sure where that comes from either, <laughs> what the size of those rooms are. Uh, and then a touch, interestingly, it's kind of bizarre. We can feel the wing of a fly falling on our cheeks from the height of three inches. So, so there you go. There are some absolute thresholds not to memorize, but to reflect upon and say, okay, is, can, do, you, do I think I could experience or I would feel or I would hear or see this amount of stimulus energy? So Gustav Beckman, we're measuring absolute threshold. Again, um, the smallest amount of stimulus energy where we can experience that consciously. Uh, Speckner was interested in studying the mind. Um, again, this wasn't something people were doing at this time, just yet they were philosophizing about the mind, but scientifically measuring and studying the mind was um, considered to be um, impossible. Really, they thought we would be too subjective. And he was interested in, so it was very quantitative and um, controlled. And he did this by examining changes in the physical stimulation itself. So systematically manipulating the physics of the world and then measuring a person's experience. In this case, do you see it? Do you hear it? Do you taste it? Uh, some of the aspects of Fechner's measurements that are important to think about is that the stimulus was present on every trial. They varied that intensity of the stimulus from trial to trial. So it would go from um, something that you, they knew you would not be able to see or hear to something they knew you would be able to see or hear. And then they would vary the intensity between those uh, in different trials. And then you're always saying, the participant is always judging, is the stimulus present? or is it absent? Do I hear it or do I not hear it? Look at some of these classic psychophysical methods that Fechner used and that people still use today. So one is the me method of limits. So if we're using these um, nine different intensities, right, to see whether or not, I'm gonna use the example of hearing a sound to see whether or not you hear a sound. And I can't really see those, but I think they go from about 96 to about 102. Um, so I'm going to start down at 96. I'm sorry, I'm gonna, I'll start to the left. I'm going to start up at 102. I'm going to play the tone. Boop, it's going to be loud. It's going to be where I know you can hear it. And you're going to say, yes, I can hear it. As you can see the Y there. 101, boop, yes. 100, boop, yes. 99, can't keep changing my intensity very well, and I'm not doing it very well anyway, but yes. 98, yes. 97, no. I didn't hear that. Okay, so that would be what we call a crossover value. It's crossed over from yes, I can hear it to no, I can't hear it. And I'm going to take that. I think that was 96.5, might be 97.5. Um, and that's going to be my crossover value. Sorry, I really can't see those numbers. I'm going to start down. Um, obviously, I didn't get my numbers right, so I'm down at maybe 94. Again, where you can't hear it, you're going to say no. I'm going to go 95, no. 96, no. 97, no. 98, no. 99. Yes, I heard that. And so now um, 98.5, because between 98 and 99 is when you change from no to yes, 98.5 is going to be my crossover value. And I might be saying the wrong numbers, but you get my point, right? And sometimes they're going to start up where I can hear it. And they're going to systematically lower that intensity until I say no. We're going to take that as a crossover value. They're going to start down where they know I cannot hear it. They're going to systematically ascend, make it louder and louder until I can hear it in this example. And then we're going to take, we're going to do that several times, take those crossover values and get the average. In this case, it was something like 97.5. That's the method of limits. This is a pretty good method. The one thing that, so there's um, a problem with what I just said. If you always start at the same exact intensities, 
then the person starts to have this anticipation of, oh, I think it's every fifth or sixth trial, and then I can hear it, then it switches over. Um, so what you would do is change those different intensities that you start at. So sometimes starting at 104, or sometimes starting at 100, but still where I know you can hear it, and then um, changing that around. Even so, people are going to try to make guesses. Um, we're going to see that the method of constant stimuli is really the best method because randomness is a beautiful thing and it does help us to uh, get a better idea of um, of what of, it doesn't people aren't anticipating something specific and so it gives us a better idea of what people just hear or see without any kind of other uh, motivational factors or um, cognitive factors as much as possible uh, coming into play next method to talk about in these classical psychophysical methods is the method of adjustment. Um, this is the fastest method to use, and it's, it's kind of quick and dirty, so it's probably the, it's considered to be the least accurate, but, but it works, and especially if you're, if you're getting um, measurements across a lot of people and taking averages across people, uh, it's probably fine. And in fact, we'll see that this was used um, for us to figure out the dark adaptation curve. But basically what a person is doing is usually it is them, the person or participant that is controlling the knob and the knob. I just stole this from this picture from Shutterstock, but the knob would have precise measurements on it. And then so they would change this knob and we've been using the example of hearing so I can just hear it. They get louder and louder. I can just hear it. And then they would um, start over. We would reset it. They get it just quieter and quieter until they just, I can just not hear it now. And again, we would take those crossover values, those, those changes um, where, where things changed for them from either being able to hear it to not hear it or vice versa, um, take those measurements several times and get an average as our measure of um, threshold in that case. And finally, the third measure, classical, psychophysical method for measuring absolute threshold is the method of constant stimuli, where now we are presenting those, whatever they were from 96 to 103. Uh, it is usually, they choose between five to nine different stimulus intensities. And again, it's going to surround what I, from what I can hear and definitely hear to what I cannot hear in the case of sound where they know I cannot hear it. And so, um, and then we're going to present those, except now we're presenting them randomly. So this constant stimuli is a random presentation of these various intensities. And then now I'm saying again, whether I hear it or not, it's always present. And I'm saying whether it's present or absent in my experience. And because this, these are randomly presented, this is the slowest method, but it's also the most accurate. There is no way for the participant to have this kind of anticipatory um, expectation, those cognitive exp expectations influencing their perception or their response. And what you can see there to the right is now what we take as the, as the measure of absolute threshold is the 50% point. Where were, where were you at 50% saying, I can hear this in the case, again, we're measure, measuring uh, sound. And you can see for like 102 and 103, for those examples up at that intensity, they're always 100% of the time they're hearing it. So it's clearly above the absolute threshold as we lo lower that and lower that to 101, 100, maybe not quite 100%. As we get down to the 96, 97, they're down at zero clearly below their threshold and they're there's zero percent of the time hearing this right it's that's not in there um, it's invisible to them so to speak in the auditory world and and then we get up uh, 98 99 sometimes they're hearing it and you can see for this example it was somewhere between um, 99 and 100 um, that was where that 50 percent landed so we were at 99.5 in this case is our estimate of absolute threshold. Again, that 50% mark. I will just say I'm using sound as an example, even though these, uh, these numbers are taken from the textbook and it's the, sort of this pretend thing. These are not decibel, decibels of sound or else this would be up in the painful 
painfully loud range, actually. So they're just, it's just a made up example. Our classical psychophysical methods that we've talked about have all been measuring the absolute threshold. Um, so this question about the detection of a stimulus, how much stimulus energy, what's the minimum amount of stimulus energy required for you to say that you experience this stimulus, or in this case that you hear this sound. Another question that they have looked at, or another threshold that they have looked at is the difference threshold, which is a question about the discrimination between two different stimuli. How different to these, do these two different stimuli have to be for us to say that, yes, I can hear that there's a difference, or yes, I can feel that there's a difference. Elements of Psychophysics, that was published by Fechner. Um, <clears throat> he actually gave complete credit to Ernst Weber, even though my understanding is that Fechner put the formula onto this, but that Ernst Weber discovered that the difference threshold um, for a particular sensory modality, so when I'm talking about sensory modalities, I mean vision or hearing, um, and this is a little overly generally stated, but I'm going to say it anyway, the difference threshold is a constant. The difference threshold is a constant fraction of the size of the standard stimulus or the stimulus that we start with. And so what this ends up being is that my constant is a K, uh, and we have discovered these constants, or Weber discovered, discovered these constants. Um, the difference threshold is denoted by DL, uh, which, which means differenza Lehmann, which is the German for difference threshold, divided by the standard stimulus. I'm going to walk through this uh, after giving some examples of um, some Weber's constants. So one of the things you can see here is that as that standard stimulus, um, as the stimulus that we start with, as its strength increases or as its loudness or heaviness increases, the size of the difference threshold is also going to have to increase so that we can keep that same constant. Fractions or Weber's constants, just so we can see what they are. And again, not to have you memorize a bunch of numbers, that's usually not my way of doing things, but um, just so you can see what they are. We only need a 1% difference in electric shock for you to say, yep, I can feel, that's, that's a harsher shock. Uh, we need a 2% difference for lifted weight, um, we need a 4% difference to tell the differences in sound intensity, an 8% difference for light intensity, and an 8% difference for changes in um, taste specific to salt. And so I did say these are for a particular sensory modality, but in the case of vision, uh, line length is going to be different than light intensity. And it could be that sugar is different than salt. So um, that's why I said that's overly stated. It's a little bit more generally stated than it's, than it's true, but that's, that's fine. And I'm gonna use this example of lifted weight. And so we're gonna stick with this constant. Remember the K, the K has been figured out for us. The K for lifted weight is decimal zero two or 2%. I need a 2% difference in order to say, yes, these two weights are different from each other. Go back to our formula where the difference threshold divided by the standard stimulus equals a constant K. And remember, we're looking at lifted weight. So our constant K is gonna be decimal zero two or 2%. 2 and so let's just say I have, a, someone has put a hundred gram weights in each of my hands. I'm holding one in my left hand, I'm holding one in my right hand, okay? They put another one gram weight in my right hand. Can I feel that difference? No, right, because I'm not to that 2%. They put another one gram weight, so now I have two extra grams in my right hand. And yes, right now I can just feel that difference. If we look at our X over 100, my starting stimulus or my standard stimulus equals decimal zero two. When we figure out this formula and go back, now I'm gonna multiply that 2% by 100, it's two grams is what I need as that difference in weight. 
So I'm going to have you think through this. I'm never going to have you do any actual calculations for this class uh, except here thinking. So these, so during the lectures that you can actually think through this, but I won't have you do this in any kind of any kind of calculations for any kind of exam. So just just knowing the formulas and what we're what we're trying to find here, right? The difference threshold. So if I start with my standard stimulus of 200 grams, I put 200 grams in each hand. Now, how much do I need to put, how much weight do I need to put in the right hand for you to say, yes, I can feel the difference. And I did leave that bit of silence as I do with my green questions for you to think about. So now I have the decimal zero two and it's times 200. And so now that is four grams, right? I need four grams of weight because it's that same, it's going to be that same 2%. And this difference threshold um, formula and these constants work as long as we're not right at the absolute threshold. As right as we're not, as long as we're not right at where you can just feel the weight, then it's a little bit different. But as long as we're at something that you can feel and it's clear, these constants work.